two miles. Uh, known as the two mile square and the 12 mile square reservations. These lands were of strategic importance to the government uh, as they were buffers around Fort Stevenson on the lower Sandusky and Fort Miami on the Maumee River. It was still, still contentious land situations in, in the, the new Ohio country. One of the lasting legacies of Native Americans in Ohio is that their names are still associated with Ohio streams. Almost all the major streams in Ohio still have um, the names that native, native people gave them. And then uh, finally, a survey uh, disputing over the border between Ohio and Michigan nearly came to blows in the mid 1830s, as both had a strong interest in the Maumee Port, Maumee Bay for deep water port. One survey resulted in Michigan gaining the port the other Ohio, a settlement in Congress awarded Ohio the port and gave Michigan its upper peninsula. Various other subdivisions were included by Congress to, in the Ohio country to set aside land for salt reservations, ministerial lands, a French grant for, for those folks swindled um, in, in Southern Ohio, and then tracks set aside for the Christian Moravian tribes in Eastern Ohio after they suffered a mass murder of nearly 100 people at the um, great Janaid and Hutton massacre in 1782. General Arthur St. Clair of the Northwest Territory, governor of the Northwest Territory, seated in Marietta and then Cincinnati, presided over the cutting up of Ohio into counties. Most of the state was named after the commander in chief. Washington County was very large as early as 1790, but it began to change rapidly. We had Two, two or three counties in 1792, a half dozen by 1797. When Ohio became a state, there were about 18 counties, some of them very large. What does any of this have to do with Ohio barns and architecture across Ohio country? Well, every one of the aforementioned factors, landform, soils, incidents, and decisions eventually influence where people of various origins migrants and immigrants might settle. The original, uh, according to the 1850 census, um, most of the migrants to the Ohio country came from middle Atlantic states, 251,000 of them. Others came from, the next largest group came from New England, 135,000 almost. And then from the South, 102,000. People actually were coming back from the West, uh, almost 10,000 of them by as early as 1850. Most of the uh, immigrants who came to, or excuse me, most of the migrants who came to Ohio were from Pennsylvania. Many of them were German, but all Pennsylvanians were not German, of course. A lot of them came from Virginia, a lot from New York, and then smaller numbers from all the other uh, states that are listed. Immigrants, the, by far the largest number of immigrants came to Ohio from Germany, second largest who left uh, less of an impact in the landscape were those from Irish. I shouldn't say they left a little impact. They built a lot of the canals and the railroads in Ohio. And the English had a lot, uh, a lot of people come here. But compared to the Germans, these other numbers are kind of minuscule. A uh, number of Swiss came here too. People from New England not only settled the Ohio Company purchase in Southeast Ohio and the Connecticut Western Reserve in Northern Ohio, but some of them came towards Central Ohio. Folks from uh, Granville, Massachusetts and Granby, Connecticut came to Central Ohio and purchased land from soldiers who didn't want to, to move here. And so there are a number of tracks in Central Ohio, uh, Granville, Worthington, and, and some other places like that. And so these English traits can be seen you can see small English towns and architectural styles in Northern Ohio, Southeastern Ohio, and in these, these areas of Central Ohio in, in a large significant uh, way. You can still see these same architectural styles almost anywhere in Ohio, but they're scattered far between. 
but they're concentrated in Granville and Worthington and other places in central Ohio and then southeast and in the Western Reserve. For instance, uh, here's an image from Canterbury, Connecticut with a, a church and maybe public buildings on the commons or the square. And you can see here where migrants, I just took two maps here, migrants from Connecticut, migrants from Massachusetts. You'll see most of them hung, uh, the Connecticut people hung around the Connecticut Western Reserve, but the folks from Massachusetts had a concentration in the Western Reserve and also down in Southeast Ohio. And you can see a bit of a concentration of these New Englanders in Central Ohio as well. Here's Cleveland, Ohio, Moses Cleveland and his astronomer surveyor, Seth Pease laid out Cleveland around a New England town square. You can see that there in the center and the old stone church still graces this square to this day. Some, a New England settlement in Jaga County with the, the, the New England style church. Here's another one in Streetsboro and Portage County of the Western Reserve. The Mormon Temple in Kirtland, Ohio. These things just repeated themselves over and over. Twinsburg and Summit County with an open space in the center of town. Same here in, uh, this is Manaway, uh, Ohio. I believe that's in Portage County and Talmadge in Summit County. And this gazebo on the commons in Hudson up in Summit County in the Western Reserve. Here's some overhead views of, of Chardon, Burton, and Illyria with their town squares. And some of the original buildings may be gone not by now, but the, the open squares are still there. This is the house, um, I believe in Hudson, a New England cottage style house. And here's the same kind in um, a similar, these, these kind of cottages, New England style, uh, concentrations of this is a New England salt box. These can be found also in um, in and around Granville. And we also with those outside of the, these communities, you'll see a lots of New England style barns. That would be either the the Yankee Ground Barns or the the, the Three Bay um, Bank Barns, or built out on the flat ground with a ramp up to them so that they could have a basement. But every one of them is different. Every single New England barn is different from every other one, but they all have some basic common uh, details. They're side, side entries and typically three bays, sometimes more than that. Sometimes they're on the ground, sometimes they're on a bank. This is a barn, a New England three bay barn up in uh, Jaga County, wooden silo, gambrel roof. Here's another one in Jaga County. So they're all, you, you, you can look far and wide, even though um, Pennsylvania abuts right up against the New England um, or the uh, Connecticut Western Reserve, you can look really, really, really hard and you won't find, to my knowledge, a Pennsylvania barn. So here's Granville laid out around a, a public square, just like uh, Cleveland and some of those towns up in the Western Reserve. And you'll see some of the same types of architectural features there. Another New England cottage, uh, the Ashley Graves House in Granville, Western Reserve style. There's a congregational church in Granville, much like those others. Then we have Worthington, Ohio, same deal. And outside of town, here's a Licking County barn we saw on the barn tour a few years ago, just outside of Granville with its uh, New England style barn, happens to have some shed roof dormers in it, not as common, but there's some other New England three bay barns up in the Licking County area surrounding Granville, Ohio. And then we have Marietta where the Ohio company purchased settled by those uh, New Englanders from Massachusetts. We have the Congregational Church with the famous Two Horn Church. This one burned down, but they have a, a new one there built 120 years ago, maybe built of brick and stone with the two horns on it. Anyway, some of these same styles of architecture. Here you have a salt box uh, house in, in Chester Hill in, in Morgan County. Here we have a New England three, uh, upright wing cottage. There's a, a, a Gothic style house in the countryside. And we have 
plenty of New England Three Bay barns all over Southeast Ohio, all over the um, Ohio Company purchase. There are there are a number of Southern barns in the Ohio Company purchase, but I've yet to see much of, uh, at least in the Southern section of it, I see no uh, no Pennsylvania German barns at all in, in almost any of Southern Ohio. Below, uh, below State Route 180 in Hawking County. I'll talk about that later. Here's a New England uh, Three Bay barn on a, a basement in Athens County. Here's a New England Three Bay bank barn with basement in Morgan County. Now, those New Englanders who settled in the Connecticut Western Reserve, of course, they didn't just stop at the Firelands. They pushed their way all the way to the Indiana border and Northwest Ohio has a lot of these double barn systems, one of the barns being older and one of them being somewhat later uh, as the farms grew, but they seem to be based on the side entry uh, three bay New England style um, barns. There might be some German barns up there too. I haven't spent enough time up there exploring. I know that the Germans went in there and drained the swamp, so to speak. and. Uh, so they probably built some barns there too. But a lot of these double barn systems in the Northwest. So the migrants from Pennsylvania appear ubiquitous across the Ohio landscape when you see their settlement uh, locations on the map. But the bank barn is a good indicator where the Pennsylvania German farmers ended up. And many of those uh, German settlers at the time of the American Revolution were pacifists who came to America fleeing the, the wars over in, in their country. And they chose not to fight in the American Revolution. So they didn't, they weren't, a lot of them weren't awarded land grants. And you'll see a lot of their um, barns in Congress lands and along the Zanes Trace, which follows, if you see that on the map there, the, the Congress lands comes in along the Zanes Trace. They also were able to buy properties from um, soldiers who chose not to come west and, and take advantage of their land grants. So Pennsylvanians, there were a lot of them. There were most, more Pennsylvanians came here than anybody. And so they're all over the state. But again, you can see concentrations of them up around the backbone of Ohio. They came in from the Pittsburgh area on the backbone there and, and followed the lake or the great trail that ran from Fort Pitt to Fort Detroit. And they got access to that part of uh, Ohio around Richland, uh, Ashland, Wayne, Holmes, and some of those counties up there, Stark County. They also, you can see a, a concentration coming along the Zanes Trace. And then you can see they're spread out across Western Ohio, but most especially toward the Southwest. And we had our barn conference in Preble County last year and we saw some Pen uh, Pennsylvania German barns over there. Somewhat different architectural styles than you find them in the East, but nonetheless, there they were. Immigrants from Germany, people from immigrants tended to settle in Ohio where they had an affinity with, with other people, whether it's a cultural, uh, traditions or language or business issues, uh, they tended to aim for, for places like that. So the folks from Germany, you can see they would, um, unless they were moving into the towns, the big cities like uh, Cleveland and Cincinnati to, to build breweries and make beer, <laughs> they were, the farmers were headed pretty much the same place the Pennsylvania uh, German farmers headed, and that was across the backbone of Ohio and then down along the Zanes Trace. And then there were two uh, major Swiss uh, settlements in Ohio, one down in Monroe County, known as the Little Switzerland of Ohio, and then a, a even bigger concentration of them up around Tuscaroras and, um, and Holmes County, that area. And then a lot of them, uh, let me back up one time, and a, a lot of them, as I mentioned, these. Germans went west, and you see a real dense cluster there around the town of Minster in, the, in western Ohio, and they built all these churches, Catholic churches mostly, with giant 
really extremely tall uh, spires. I was uh, up there a couple of years ago seeing some friends and lived up in Salina, Ohio, and he said, uh, I mentioned how you could see those steeples from a long distance across the flat farmland and sticking up even over the tops of, of woodlots, et cetera. You could see them a mile away. And he said, yeah, we always did the steeple chase out there. I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, near, right nearby every one of those, those tall steeples, there's a bar. And so they were running from bar to bar to bar. But anyway, that area in Western Ohio is, is distinctive with its architectural styles, both in the, the churches and, and of course on the farms. And these tall church steeples still um, grace the landscape over there. And as I was mentioning, some of the barns in Western Ohio, that was the last part of the state settled because it took longer to get through the, the forest to get over there. Why go over there when you can build a farm closer? And so by the time got, people got there 20 years, 30 years later, there was probably some, some of these barn building teams were, were collaborating and, and you know, some of these barns were probably put up by uh, the next generation of barn builders. But anyway, so many of these church steeples over there. And when you get over there, uh, you see the Pennsylvania German barns. Then there's the Pennsylvania settlements, towns like along the Zanes Trace, like Somerset, that were built around the Pennsylvania, or the, yeah, the Pennsylvania Diamond Square. And they would, they would kind of like the, the New Englanders did, they laid their survey out around a public commons in the center. Uh, it was, this was done in Somerset and in um, Lancaster, in Fairfield County. They were just down, down the road from each other along Zane's Trace. This is Somerset and Perry County with, uh, you know, 100 years later, they put a, a statue in the center to, to honor uh, General Philip Sheridan a couple of decades after the Civil War their favorite hometown boy. But these, uh, all four corners of the square were left open. And so it's not built on, you know, just a, a regular downtown street like you see in many towns. The original courthouse in Perry County was in Somerset, that's it there. Uh, but there was a political battle which relocated the county seat to New Lexington some years later. And this building still stands today. It's the longest or the, yeah, the longest continuously operating public building in the Northwest Territory built in 1829 and always been in public service. It serves as a city hall today and um, has a jail on the back end there surrounded by a stone. It's hard to get out of there. And then the upstairs is public facility space. And the four corners were left open around the square and they have activities, uh, art shows, performances, things like that on the square in Somerset. A lot of the buildings in Somerset are adjoining buildings like they are in Southeast Pennsylvania where Somerset, Pennsylvania is, German characteristic. And, and you see structures like this similar in, in uh, German village another German settlement in, in Ohio country. And you can also see small brick German houses on State Route 180 between Logan and, and, um, and Chillicothe on, on State Route 180. And State Route 180 running between those two towns is the southern limit of the Pennsylvania German barn. There are German barns in Northern Hocking County. There are none in Southern Hocking County. There are, even though the largest number of immigrants in Athens and Meigs and Washington County are German, there are no German barns to be seen down there. But again, just because they're German doesn't mean they were farmers, <laughs> I guess. That's, that's a question I always wanted to ask Dr. Hubert Wilhelm before he died, why are, why are there no German barns in, in places where there is still the largest number of the, the immigrants on the 1850 census? Outside of Somerset, you can see the, this German influence on their gravestones. Uh, the etchings are in German. And that's common in a lot of places in Perry County and in 
of Fairfield County and probably also in Western Ohio. Just outside of Somerset is this uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, bank barn with the uh, cantilevered four bay, the Poorman farm. Very impressive uh, timber frame structure. And uh, it has a large stone hanging on the side. of It looks like a piece of slate, but it's not. It's probably three inches thick. But anyway, it's been hanging on that barn for whoa, 200 years, looks like. And um, it's got the German stylized swastikas still on it. Uh, they were put on it a good 150 years before it was corrupted by uh, in World War II. There's a Pennsylvania uh, German bank barn with the four bay just outside of Somerset. It was torn down a year or so ago. This is another one along the old Zanes Trace outside of Somerset. This is a massive barn. And uh, I think the four bay here extends out eight to eight or nine feet. And it turns out to be, it's a double, a double crib log barn with, with the four, with the overhanging four bay. It's got a stone house nearby. And then just down the road along the Zanes Trace is Lancaster. Lancaster was built around a, a uh, Pennsylvania Diamond Square. And the original county courthouse in, in Lancaster was built right in the center of that town square and is built also in the federal style like the one in, uh, like the one in Somerset. Matter of fact, most early courthouses in Ohio were built in the federal style, uh, following the style of the first three state capitol buildings in Chillicothe, uh, Zanesville, and in Columbus. And this is some of the open space in the, the Diamond Square of downtown Lancaster. About 100 years ago, the city of Lancaster took one of the corners, one of the parks, and built a, a new city hall on it, new city hall 100 years ago. But it's still got three of its main um, corners in there. They have lots of festival and activity, um, art and different types of activities there. Here's a, a uh, Pennsylvania German cottage in Lancaster. This is just some of the place names. Uh, in Fairfield County, we have Bremen and we have uh, Hamburg, but uh, some look at some of the other uh, German names of towns in Ohio, Dresden, Berlin, uh, Strasbourg, places like that. But, but most especially Fairfield County, look at the, the names of some of their roadways, Allspach, Hummel, Bronx, Stemmen, Mauger, Bodder. All over the county, you run into these German um, references. There's a uh, posted Pennsylvania German barn, posted four bay, just outside of Lancaster, along the Hocking River. There's another one uh, along the Zanes Trace between Somerset and uh, Lancaster. The Pennsylvania German barns, for those of you who don't know, I hate telling this stuff to people who know all these things already, but both the Pennsylvania German barns and the New England barns are, gate, are uh, side entries. And uh, they have wind doors uh, on the threshing floor and you can see the wind doors here in this image, uh, and they're always opposite the drive door. And uh, that comes in, that becomes significant when we talk about the Southern barns. But that's two things, those two, and they're often built into a bank. So the German and the New England barns, often bank barns, threshing floors with uh, wind doors and always a side entry to the, to the building. Here's another uh, Pennsylvania German barn with the overhanging four bay that was posted. This was on the Zanes Trace between Lancaster and Tarleton on the way to Chillicothe. And uh, that was in a, it was a pretty impressive barn. You can see the horse in the slate there and the date uh, 1888, the name Reese. And I forget what that, that bottom name says. Anyway, it's gone. Somebody took that barn away. 
not far from both Somerset and Lancaster are these uh, double overhanging four bay barns. There were a handful of them built all in a similar region, probably by the same barn building teams. Uh, access to the drive door on one side and the wind doors would be on the other side. There's another double hanging, double overhanging four bay. Here's another posted four bay on a German barn in Hocking County. This was their bicentennial barn for two months back in 2003. And, and then it was torn down to make a, a gas station. You can see the wind doors there. Um, don't know why they couldn't have incorporated and repurposed that into probably the most um, attractive fueling station in Southeast Ohio. Never occurred to them. It's another posted four bay. This one is on State Route 180 between Logan and, and um, Chillicothe. This is again, the Southern limit of the um, Pennsylvania German barns as, as Dr. Wilhelm uh, determined. And uh, there's a number of them. If you drive out State Route 180, I haven't been out there in 15 years now. There were many of them. I don't know how many are left, but I have never seen one south of there except for on the southern end of the Zanes Trace down in Adams County. There were apparently some Germans who came up the trace from, from the Ohio River. And there's, a, there's one on the uh, Governor um, Kirker property in Adams County. It's a very impressive um, Pennsylvania German barn, but they're just not seen in Southern Ohio, even with all the German immigrants who settled there. Now there are the German uh, bank barns and, and German barns with the four bays up around uh, the backbone of Ohio, up around Richland County, Ashland County, Wayne County, um, Holmes and Stark and Tuscaroras County, lots and lots and lots of these barns up there. Here's one with you know, gable roof dormers missing about four cupola. I think that's somewhere up around Wayne County. I can't remember exactly where. Now these German farms, they don't, they have any number of different types of houses on them, but you don't usually see a New England style house on a Pennsylvania barn, uh, farm, but you do see I houses. This would be a northern I house, which is basically a, a rectangular frame with a, a central chimney. Here's a double doors on this. A lot of the uh, I houses have two front doors. One door went into the living room. The other door went into a parlor. That parlor was often used uh, when somebody died. They would put person on display in there for a wake and or it might be a place to, to bring in guests or something like that, but it wasn't uh, commonly used by the family. But you can see it's got one room over another room upstairs, central stairway and a central chimney to, to capture all the uh, heat from the chimney in the Northern Eye House. Here's a Northern Eye House with a hip roof. And another one with gable roof. Another one with a hip roof with a kitchen added on the back. Another eye house. Now this one's two, two rooms over two rooms, a little bit bigger, but it still has two front doors. It's very common in some parts of the state and less common in others. A lot of places you just have a single front door. There's another um, eye house with a central chimney with the kitchen added uh, later on, on this. It also, this is in Washington County. Uh, this has two front doors as well. This is a, a southern eye in Athens County, and it has a single front door, but the chimneys are moved to the end walls of the house. But being in the northern state, the chimneys are inside the exterior walls, so they can capture a lot of the heat, but they don't get as much efficiency as a central chimney. In the southern states, you'll find the chimney on the outside of the wall so that they don't overheat the home. Here you go, this is a, a southern eye with the chimneys on the exterior portion of the, the uh, house. There you see the kitchen addition, and uh, it may be original or may not. Oftentimes they were added later, and that's two rooms over two as well. 
another Northern Eye house with the central chimney, single front door, double eye, or I mean a Southern Eye house with a single um, front door. Now we have the migrants who came up from the Southern states. Here we got on the left, we have people from Virginia. They pretty much just came across the river and scattered pretty far and wide across the Ohio countryside. There seems to be a couple concentrations, uh, one in what looks like Licking County here. And uh, I'm not sure what county that might be there, Clinton maybe or something, but they're fairly well scattered. And then those who came from Kentucky, a lot of them just made it across the river. They settled here in the Kentucky bluegrass or the Lexington Plain and grew tobacco down there. There's a lot of tobacco barns in this region. There are also a lot of tobacco barns over near Greenville over in Dark County, but um, they pretty much are scattered far and wide. The, dis the distinctive difference with Southern barns, and again, every one of them is different from every other Southern barn, but they, they are completely different from northern or from New England barns and Pennsylvania barns in that they don't have a side entry under the gutter. They don't typically have a threshing floor or wind doors. They have a gable end entry and they have a hay hood typically, but not always. And um, it's probably uh, these differences likely reflect different farming traditions, much like different con as, as much as different um, construction techniques. So here's a gamble roofed uh, southern barn with a hay hood in Jackson County with an addition on it. But the entry is, is the gable end on, on the rear. Here's an interesting hay hood, kind of looks like a bird's beak to me. Here's a uh, southern barn in Pickaway County with the gable end entry, a massive um, hay hood and a couple of shed additions. Shed roofed additions. This has got a hay hood on both ends. This is unique. This is in Hawking County, but still the gable end entry, no threshing floors, and uh, they're very different. This is a, a gable end entry, gable roof barn in Athens County, southern barn, um, no hay hood, but again, no threshing floor either. Another one in Athens County, very small sort of a minor hay hood on that one, gable end entry. This one's over in um, Adams County. Very, very, uh, this says no, no hay hood. But you can see you can't get in on the side doors. You can look out the windows on the side, but you can't enter the side of these buildings like you do with New England and Pennsylvania German barns. Here's another one down in, in Adams County with an interesting hay hood and a gable end entry. Athens County, no hay hood, but gable end. This is in Hawking County with a little baby hay hood on it, gamber roof. This is a similar one with a much larger hay hood in Washington County, no longer standing. This is a, a Southern Transverse barn in Athens County with a very tiny hay hood and some shed roof additions. This is a Southern barn in and way up in Knox County, gable end entry, camber roof, small hay hood with some shed roof dormers and a couple of shed roof additions onto that barn. So they were scattered far and wide. Uh, this is a, a southern barn in Muskingum County with a very large hay hood on it. And the southern farms, they can also have about any kind of houses because they were built up there in the north. There may be a northern eye house, southern eye house, maybe a um, what's called the American Four Square House. But there's a lot of southern eye houses down here. This is one in Vinton County. This is in Brick. This is one in uh, Athens County with gable end or with the um, chimneys on the ends, two front doors. This is over on the Ohio River in Washington County, looking right over at Old Virginia um, by one of the earliest settlers in, in Ohio. Um, this building was going to be torn down by the power company up here, but there's a group of people in Washington County trying to save this. It was built by, um, oh, what's his name? He built ships out of big timbers 
on the uh, Ohio River cut down in Washington County and they sailed, they floated down the Ohio River to the Gulf and then they sailed around the world, around the tips of Africa and uh, South America. They went to Japan and places like that. I'm forgetting his name right now, um, but that was his house. It's very significant Ohio and apparently not significant enough that I remember his name at the moment, however. But here's your typical uh, American four square house. You will see this on lots of farmsteads. They can be German farmsteads or Southern farmsteads, probably even on New England farmsteads, just because they have a New England barn doesn't mean they have a, a New England cottage on their farmstead. Here's another uh, Southern eye house with the later kitchen added on the rear end with the chimney in the kitchen there. There's a Southern eye in Morgan County with the double chimneys. Kitchen added much later. Then there's just going to say something briefly about round barns. <laughs> They're scattered pretty far. The only place I know with any concentration on is Perry County, which has four. But this is a uh, Fairfield County on the Fairfield County Fairgrounds. This is one of the four round barns in Perry County. And this is another one of them. This is the one in worse shape in Perry County. This is in Hocking County. And this one is over 100 years old, but it's, it's made of concrete. It was a little horse barn, but it's round. And this is an octagonal barn way up in Northwest Ohio in Williams County. We toured this hey, on Tom, I think um, somehow your audio has been disconnected. Is everybody else not having, not able to hear Tom? I can still hear Tom. I can hear him. I can hear him. Yeah, I, I can, can hear. hear. I can hear him. Just you, Sarah. Well, I just have a few more slides here. Okay, so it may just be my audio. Sorry. <laughs> this is the uh, this is a octagonal barn up in Williams County. That's a group of Friends of Ohio barns barn tour members way back way back around two thousand and two or three, touring that barn in Williams County. Uh, here's an octagonal barn as in Western Ohio. I can't remember which county this one was in, but we toured that on a a barn tour one day. This is an octagonal barn in Benton County. And this is the last one. I think this is in Clark County that we toured one year. So I just threw them in there. There's, I think if you had money, you could build one of these, but they don't necessarily um, associate with Pennsylvania Germans or New Englanders or uh, Southerners that I've had a chance to look into. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Anyway, that's the last picture I have. So uh, if anybody has any questions or, or any answers, be happy to hear them. Uh, Tom, can you hear yes. me? Yes, sir. Uh, it's Dan here. Did you, have you ever come across any um, of the newspaper advertisements that occurred in the late 1700s in New England or Virginia area newspapers? Um, saying, hey, come to Ohio, and this is what land is selling for, and this is what the farming is like, anything like that? I have not. I'm wondering how people got word that Ohio was a great place to farm and to move to, how that was, how that was done. That's a good question. Can you get back to me on that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up right now on Google, Tom. <laughs> Tom, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Okay. I apologize. I had some kind of technical issue with my uh, headset, I guess. So um, thank you so much for your presentation. I always learn so much from you and your travels. Um, I'm not seeing, do we have any questions? If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. There's some in there, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a question, Tom. Yeah. This is Bill Hardman. Yeah. Um, the oldest barn that I've come across so far in Ohio has been that one that you showed, the Poorman barn from 1819. Have you guys come across any uh, older barns than that in Ohio? Any of you guys? Yeah, I think on the uh, 2003 barn tour, 
we were in a um, a double crib log barn, I think, in uh, Ross County off State Route 180. <laughs> yep. Uh, that somebody said might have been around 1795 or something. One of the earlier barns, I remember it's hearing this Do mm -hmm. you remember, Rudy? Yes, I do. That's that's the one that had the uh, reject siding boards from the house used to close off the um, log walls because they had actually made a threshing floor between the two cribs. Um, and we have uh, that uh, watercolor painting we bought at the auction. Um, in 2003. In 2003, yeah. yeah. Bicentennial. So, yeah, that was a beautiful barn. Remember, we had to go back to it because it wasn't originally on the tour. And then we went back to it and discovered it was just ancient. It was a beautiful barn. Right after, wow. we, right after we toured a round barn. Yep. On the same road there. Yeah. Yep. Do you know yep. if it's still still standing? I don't. It's back off the road. You can't drive by that one and see it, I don't believe. Mm hmm Nice. Thanks. I, I heard someone, um, and I haven't I haven't been to their barn in a long time, but uh, they said they had the land deed signed by Jefferson. So he was president 1801 to what, 1808 or nine. Um, <clears throat> but you know, anytime somebody says something is super old, I always want to uh, get Nick Weisenberg down and, and do a dendro on it to prove it. Because it's, you know, you can you get some really good clues. We know it's early 1800s, but uh, I think dendro is the CAT scan for these things to really give us the answer. But yeah, I, I don't know, uh, Rudy and Laura and Rick, you guys know, is, has anyone laid claim in Ohio to uh, the oldest barn? I don't know that anybody that I know of has actually said that this is definitely the oldest barn and being able to prove it. I, I don't think so. I mean, it'd be an interesting thing to, to study because one of the one of the things that um, Tom's presentation really inspired in, in my thinking is that how do we how do we go back and look at where these barns are compared to when these people got here? so that we can begin to look at how old they must be based on when people were here. You know, I mean, obviously there were people here way before the barns were built and they were all indigenous people. But once the indigenous people got pushed out, the first thing we would have been, been done is build a barn because that's, that's your sustenance. And yeah. how many of those have survived? Um, we, can, we can pretty much predict where we're going to find the old ones based on the work that Tom's doing and the work that you've um, done. Um, I think we can actually, I think it would be interesting to try to put together a, a, a search following the migratory patterns to see how many barns we can find that still exist in the earliest places that Ohio was settled. Yeah, and, and you know, when Tom, when you were showing those slides, uh, this is where the Irish settled and you, you saw some little areas that were just loaded with Irish or Scottish and some areas with Swiss. And I wanna go right to where those dots were and look at the barns, see if there are any early barns, pre-Civil War, of course, where those dots are that we could say, oh yeah, that, that's definitely Swiss. Cause I always thought, well, you know, is there is there a Scottish barn? Is there an Irish barn? Um, Irish so barns are stone barns. Stone. Hey, those are hard to dendro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, Tom, right across from my house here on the Olentangy River, by the Liberty Presbyterian Church, um, which is uh, just just south of that uh, along 315, um, the guy that built the big house across from me, he had this log cabin torn down. I'm sorry, log house, <clears throat> and uh, I got some of the the logs from it. They're a mixture of white oak and some poplar and maple uh, and a lot of walnut. But on two of the logs, sections that had been cut small because windows had been put in them, on the interior face, cut out, carved out in carving that, that we know is authentic just from the style. It said October 20, 1812. Um, I tried to get a hold of some guy that says he was a wallpaper for that guy, took him and I haven't been able to, he won't return my phone calls. I don't know what he's done with them, but that's so that we know that 
Thomas Seller set, settled this area right up here where I am by the church uh, in 1802. But um, the first barn that that his son put up that still that was still standing a while back was eight, was Dendro to 1830. Um, but I'd love to see. Do you think, Rudy, that that the earliest barns, let's say prior to 1830, that they were timber framed or was there a, a tendency to build them just out of logs? Well, I, 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 I don't know that I can answer that question directly because I haven't done the kind of research that Tom has done, but I think if you look at the settlement patterns of the people, it's pretty likely that we're going to find that the oldest barn in Ohio is a log crib barn. Yeah, um, and the reason I say that is that we're looking at very early settlement from the Appalachian region in a lot of the Southern Ohio country. And so I think we may find that we actually had crib barns here before we had English barns or German barns. Yeah, um, that's my hunch. Yeah, but I, 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 I have no way of, of saying that with any confidence at all. It's just my hunch too. Dan and I looked at a, uh, and, and Rudy and Laura, you guys have seen this barn too in Ross County. The, um, I don't know what the name of it is, but it's on the Hopewell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's a scribe rule barn. It's got about a 20 by 22 foot footprint. All yeah, hand. I don't, four I'm not sure it's a barn, Tom. I don't think it's a barn. What kind? I don't think it's a barn. Oh, okay. I think it's a, um, some sort of either commercial structure or maybe a very early, very early meeting house um, because it doesn't have the characteristics that you need in a barn to make it useful. Think about that barn. There is no good yeah. access for hay. There is no good access. The only place that animals were ever kept was in the additions, but the main structure itself doesn't have the function of a barn. I don't think it was a barn, but I think it's very early and it very possibly could be one of the earliest timber frames. Yeah, we should dendro that. In Ohio. Yep. All right, guys, I'm going to jump in uh, just to make sure I get to a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Um, we had a question about sort of estimating what the percentage of barns uh, with slate versus wood shingle roofs. And of course, we're talking about sort of different um, time periods here, but also where a continuation of that question, where did the slate roof material come from? Well, I could defer that. I, I think a lot of the slate came from Pennsylvania and that slate's the stuff that doesn't last more than a little more than a hundred years. And then some, some of the better slate that you see in Ohio came from, I think, Vermont or somewhere in New England. Yeah, yeah. But New I know. And as far as shingle roofs, I, a lot of buildings may have started with shingle roofs yes. and eventually got replaced. Well, once we had the, the rail system in Ohio, you know, 1850s and 60s, then we started transporting a lot more materials. But I don't, and there's some slate that came across from Pennsylvania mostly, uh, maybe early 1870s. But I think the oldest that we've seen a date in a slate roof uh, is 1880 or 1881. Now, it may have come in earlier than that. And then here's where I wish we could go to old farmer's almanacs or newspapers and said, where they would say, hey, slate, put, put slate on your roof, it's forever, something like that. But, but I think, you know, 1880s, mostly in 1890s, it was, it was extremely popular. And one thing I wanted to mention, Tom, and all of those barns that, that you showed that have hay hoods, people should know that you didn't have a hay hood unless you had a hay track to bring that hay up. So in the hay tracks and the trolley cars really didn't, weren't very popular here in Ohio. I don't think until the 1880s, that's, that was their heyday. Um, maybe some in the 1870s. There's some early hay tracks, but I think they really became popular in the 80s and 90s. So that kind of, that's one way to date those barns um, if they have hay hoods, you know, they had hay tracks available for sale then. We had another question about um, 
the difference between a two over two I house and a folk farmhouse in terms of architectural style. Two over two and a what? A two over two I house and a folk farmhouse. Hmm. I don't know. I, I'm not sure what a folk arm, farmhouse is. Um, I don't either. Sometimes they just have a single room spanning the entire upstairs piece of folk Appalachian architecture. I know one pretty well in Southeast Ohio. Um, I don't know, but I, I noticed that a lot of the, the um, eye houses just are one room over one room on the upstairs with a, a stairway going between them. I don't know that much about uh, them. Most of what I know about architecture is what I can determine at 55 mile an hour on a <laughs> And in Tim Cook. Well, and I also think folk frequently refers to just sort of something vernacular, you know, that has developed. It maybe can't be classified into a specific architectural style. Um, any other questions for Tom or for our developing panel of experts here? <laughs> <laughs> I just had one other question um yeah one of my favorite barns is i'm sure you're familiar with it dan at um where 23 and 315 intersects uh stratford barn with the um all stone um gable ends so i've seen a few of those barns like right in that area along the Olentangy river yes you guys familiar with any other barns um similar to those around Ohio that seem, seem kind of unique from what I've seen? Well, B Bill, there were, uh, there were four stone enders there. I think they're all uh, Pennsylvania barns. Um, I think we, and Nick came up and we dendroed the house right next to it. I think that one you're referring to where Garth's auction was, was 18. 40s, I think, the house. So that's the barn in that area. Uh, the barn where Garth's had their auction, I guess they're going to have them, they're restoring the barn. Um, the lower section, the undercarriage was restored uh, properly by Caleb and John. But then all of a sudden, some company that knows nothing about timber framing is, has torn the roof off and is doing all kinds of stuff upstairs, oh probably just with a bunch of steel and uh, two by fours. Um, so I have no idea what they're planning on doing with it, but it's kind of ironic that they're putting the money into that. And just up the road, uh, a quarter mile is a, a stone ender. Uh, when I say stone ender, the, the two gable ends are stone and it's a four bay barn and it's in much better condition. Uh, and there's a guy living there, but of course it's, it's uh, deteriorating slowly, but surely, but yeah, there were, there were four or five of them right there in that area along the river. There's still two of them. Yeah. Oh Yeah beyond beyond the garth auction barn yep. yeah yeah i've seen those two and there's another one a little farther north really up in uh in delaware right on the outskirts of delaware again yep. along yep. the river i know where you are bill yeah, yeah but uh, you haven't seen any any other places like that in ohio no it, that's kind of weird that we we find those stone enders rudy have you seen stone enders in ohio other than we must no, not just in that area. Yeah, that's no, we've, seen, Rickens. we've seen we've seen um, actually we had one on tour um, in Holmes County, one of the oldest uh, barns that we had seen uh, on tour for a long time, and it was a stone end barn uh, that had the um, mm. had the owl hole was in the one of the gable up and the top and the gable end in the stone. That, we, that you had said, Rudy, was very um, interesting and unique that we had not seen before. Right. Yeah. I, I remember, forgot about that one. Yep. I remember you know, a, brick, a brick ender barn up on, I think, Route 62 or Route 3, somewhere up in Route 3. Route no, 3. it was on 90, 95 in Wayne County. And we lost that one, what, five years ago now? Yeah, four more. It, it burned maybe more than that. And I don't know of another brick ender. Hmm. You know, Tom and, and group, I have to say that as a, one of the takeaways from this, and it's apparent every year when we have our conference, but especially when you do a, a lecture like this, if, you know, we've been we've been studying barns for our group for 20 years. And, you know, I've been involved 
you know, peripherally and lo had a love of Barnes for 35 years. And, and uh, Rudy, you're, you've been at it uh, since what, the 1930s, I think. Um, <laughs> 1830s. 1830s. I just, the more we, the more we see and the more we learn, the more yeah. I realize what we do not know and how much there is to discover. And it's just like, <laughs> you look at what Tom's put into this and Greg, how, what, what you put into this over the years, you could work, you could work 40 hours a week for, you know, for 30, 40 years and, and crack the surface and have a pretty good understanding of this. Um, but it just, it, it just baffles me and it makes me appreciate, I'm kind of in awe of, of the, all of this history. And um, it's kind of sad that we know as little as we do, but I think it's a, a noble endeavor to keep trying to learn more. And I think our group is doing that. I, I also think, Dan, that it's important that we have people from different backgrounds looking at this um, entire process of how these barns got here, which is what Tom just did for us. Is he, he pointed out the fact that it's not just what kind of barn it is because you can tell by how it's built who built it you have to go back and look at actually where the people came from what was the purpose in building it in the first place what resources did they have and how how did that end up creating something that lasted for the generations that it has because if you look at it from a barn builder's perspective then you get one point of view. If you look at it from an architect's perspective, you look at it from another point of view. If you look at it from a geologist, geologist perspective, you look at it from another point of view. So I think it's the combinations of so many different people having an interest in our barns that's going to give us a better understanding of what they are, not just the way that you look at them or the way that I look at them, or even just the way that Tom looks at them. Right, no, it's a, a group effort to try to figure yeah. it all out. I came across a, a reference in searching some family genealogy that I thought people might be interested in. They talk about November 10th, 1782, the Battle of Chillicothe. George Rogers Clark uh, had a battle uh, on what would have then been the Shawnee village of Chalagatha uh, with uh, uh, where there were apparently about a thousand Shawnees. And uh, this was uh, referred to as the last battle of the American Revolution. I had never heard that before uh, and until I came across this and I thought it might be of interest to some of our participants here tonight. Sure. Has anybody else ever heard of this no. Battle of Chillicothe no. in 1782 <laughs> as the last battle of the revolution? <laughs> but uh, there are certainly in the uh, Chillicothe area, uh, right from Massey on down at the Grandview Cemetery, there are lots of Revolutionary War vet veterans. So for what it's worth. <laughs> well, thank you. I have something to add. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, I was interested in, um, Tom, what you were saying about um, the, um, the deeds. My mom has the original deed to their farm from the Virginia Military Land Grant. And uh, it's on parchment paper, and it's signed by um, Thomas Jefferson, um, was the president, and James Madison was, um, I think, the Secretary of State. <clears throat> um, and uh, you were talking about how the surveys were done by marking, you know, the tree and um, the rock, different things like that. And um, part of their survey was marked by a rock pointing north under a fence post. Hmm. And um, dad had a real problem with that, with um, the Delaware County uh, um, mapping office. <laughs> they didn't want to go along with that. So my dad had a good friend uh, in Delaware 
who was a surveyor, an old surveyor, and they actually dug and found that rock pointing north underneath the fence wow. post. It was pretty cool. But um, but anyway, yeah, I'd love to have uh, somebody check out their uh, old barn sometime. My mom's having some work done to the house right now, and it's been kind of hard finding people um, you know, to do work. She just had her two chimneys. There's a chimney on each end of her house. She just had those um, it worked on so that she, to that keep the original look, but so she'd like to have some work done on her barns as well. Not sure how old they are. They're pretty old. Judy, can you send us a picture of that land deed signed by Jefferson and Madison? Uh -huh. <laughs> we uh, we store it in a lockbox, but I made copies of it, you know, yeah. so that people don't flip through. But yeah, I, I'll send it yeah, to I'd you. I'd love to see a picture of that. But yeah, Madison was the Secretary of State, so. Yeah, that, what's that, really uh, cool, uh, back then they, they had a lot more description um, when they transferred the land. Um, so that was interesting. I wish they did that more today, you know, why they sold it. And uh, one guy sold it, his son had it and then sold it back. And uh, I, I think we talked about where did farms have to be paid for within a certain amount of time or something at some point way back in the day? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, cash up front, you know. Yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty, pretty neat. It was uh, another thing. It was, uh, I think, 1,200 acres. And it got split up, I think, into six, seven parcels. And it was uh, Elizabeth Rickman was uh, who it was given to, which I thought was um, odd being a female. Yeah. I'm going to wrap things up here folks we're coming up on 8 30 and i know um we have a collection of really knowledgeable people and um when this group gets going we can go probably all night so um we'll wrap things up and i do want to remind you all that we have another lecture yet this winter again on february 8th that'll be with jack sobin and i know it's going to be um, another really great opportunity to learn something more about our state history um, and about barns so if you are not a member of Friends of Ohio Barns, remember to check out our website, friendsofohiobarns.org. And a big thank you to Tom O'Grady for his time tonight. I know he had a couple of speaking engagements this week, and um, I really appreciate him taking the time to share his knowledge with us. Yes, so, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Great job, Tom. Great job. And wishing you all a wonderful evening, and we'll see you on February 8th. You can register now on our website. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.